I'm Dagger Shadow, the actress now to the best hair, and it's time for the thing. It's actually a lot more specific than it sounds. Of course, I'm referring to John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982. It's a quasi-remake of The Thing from Another World from 1951. Or rather, it's a movie version of the story that movie was based on, Who Goes There, by John W. Campbell in 1938. Where The Thing from Another World is a story about that time a U.S. Air Force crew in Alaska saved the world from an alien plant monster, and the hero gets the girl in the end, The Thing is about a U.S. science team in Antarctica who encounters a strange alien life form with the power to mimic its victims. You know, what the book was about. I'm saying there's no differences, I doubt the original book took place in 1982, but to say that this is a remake of the 1951 movie isn't really accurate. Also, to say that the new The Thing is a remake of this one also isn't accurate. That was actually a prequel. But in the case, our tale of terror follows a group of scientists as they... do science in Antarctica. However, their experiments involving smoking and playing ping-pong are turned on their head when a mysterious alien life form infiltrates their installation. With nowhere to escape to in the frozen continent, they alone stand in between The Thing and the entire human race! And trying to figure out exactly how it works is... Uh, little difficult, so let's take a look at The Thing. That can be taken in so many ways. Our story begins in space! A flying saucer makes good use of the film's ridiculously huge budget on alien schnapps, as this wobbly-ass spaceship is careening right into Earth! Where on Earth? Antarctica, where we go to meet one of the best acted characters in the film, the Doggo, played by White Fang himself, Jed. The Norwegians in the helicopter, though, aren't the biggest fans. Either that, they saw the Dog Soldiers review as well and aren't taking any chances. The logical result of playing too much Duck Hunt is only half the tale, though. There's the U.S. Research Station 4 to visit. Or 31, depending if you listen to the dialogue or the props. The important thing is we get to watch Kurt Russell do a let's play on that super high-tech video chess. Welcome to Night 6. Checkmate. Keep the bitch. He's right, you know, that wasn't a checkmate. He was in a pretty shit spot, but it would take more than one move to end the game. The two groups meet soon enough, as the helicopter chase has brought them all the way to the American facility. They greet the dog with open arms, but that's nothing a grenade can't fix. Ah, I see. Using the old PlayStation Move control is... He can talk instead of fighting. But... He's Norwegian, which means there's a very high probability that he knows English, but fuck it, no, I represent! Also, he does say some things in Norwegian that would be very helpful for these guys' survival if they knew what he was saying, but he also shot one of them in the leg, so... That's how you do foreign relations the American way. This introduces most of the cast too fast for me to rattle off, so for now I'll just point out Revolver Ocelot over here is the man in charge of the station, Gary, played by Donald Moffat, and Kurt Russell is the group's helicopter pilot, McCready. The man who was shot was Bennings, played by Peter Maloney, and the man tasked with patching him up is Dr. Copper, played by Richard Dreisett. They figure the Norwegians maybe just went mad down here, so far from civilization, but it's hard to confirm this as their radio technician, Windows, played by Thomas G. Waits, hasn't been able to contact anyone in weeks. No bother. Chief scientist guy Dr. Blair, played by Wilfred Brimley, hasn't given up hope. Get a hold of somebody. Get a hold of anybody. We gotta report this mess. Get a hold of Liberty Medical. They can help if you or a loved one has been diagnosed with diabetes. Hollywood career spanning six decades and 77 roles, and he will forever be known as Diabetes Man. The chef, Nalls, played by T.K. Carter, roller skates in to point out he's also our streetwise, hip, young member of the team, while David Clennon plays Palmer, the resident stoner every 80s horror movie seems contractually obligated to include. New faces from left to right are Vance, played by Charles Hallahan, Childs, played by Keith David, and Fuchs, played by Joel Polis. Guess that means the only one I missed introducing earlier was that sled dog handler, Clark, played by Richard Mauser. No bother. Now that introductions are out of the way, the group decides that Mac and Dr. Copper should head over to that Norwegian base for answers as to why the men came screaming, shooting, and blowing up their own helicopter. The dog, in the meantime, gets to freely roam around the compound, coming and going as it pleases.
This week at Jimmy John's, you can get 20% off orders of $10 or more by using promo code SAVE20. That's 20% off any combination of sandwiches, drinks, and sides you can imagine. Combos for days. Just use SAVE20 online or on our app. It's like that jump scared by a friend scene we see in every horror movie except from the other character's perspective. We can get plenty of spooky situations down at the Norwegian science base though, as when Mac and Doc arrive, they find the place has been burnt to a crisp, looking like some horrible extreme reverse icy hot experiment gone wrong. My god, what the hell happened here? Okay, he slid his wrists and Probably unnecessarily, considering his blood was so cold it froze on the way out. It's like he's just sitting there waiting to die freezing to death. It's like, this is taking too long, I'll do it myself! That's not the only thing the Norwegians were doing out here, though. A scary block of ice! Unfortunately, the ice is empty, and while it's sized and shaped in a nice homage to the ice block from the 1951 movie, the characters don't see anything too significant about it just yet. However, on their way out of the base, they come across the burnt remains of some horrifying, indescribable monstrosity in the snow. So, naturally, they dig it up and haul that motherfucker back with them to show everyone! We found this. seen anything like that before. Grotesque, pungent, and probably carrying all kinds of diseases. So everyone, I want you to gather around and take nice big gasps of air, okay? But let's not forget, they're scientists. Scientists who study all kinds of science down here. Therefore, it's up to Dr. Blair to perform an autopsy and learn everything he can about the creature they found. Well, what we got here is what appears to be, anyway, a normal set of internal organs. Heart, lungs, Kidneys, liver, intestines. And they all show signs of type 2 onset diabetes. Honestly, Wilford Brimley here was just about the only guy on set who didn't get queasy during the autopsy scene. Gutting enough animals in your life will do that for you. Oh well, while the necromorph fails to impress, Clark is tasked with taking the new dog to the kennel with the rest of them. Leaving the creature alone and in the dark, and spending so long with the camera fixated on this mundane task, it shouldn't be surprising to find out things aren't quite what they seem. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe time to take him to the vet. That's right, the dog is in fact the thing, and begins transforming with all kinds of weird new body parts, and attacks the other dogs around him. Obviously this makes more than a little noise, which causes Clark to come back and check on what's going on, finding a monster where his dogs are supposed to be. He doesn't get to call for help though, that comes down to Mac hearing the noise and smashing the fire alarm with his beer. By the time everyone gathers around, the beast has changed form quite drastically, and it comes down to Childs rushing in with a flamethrower to take it down. <laughs> You guys might want to think about letting it roast for a little while longer before running in with the fire extinguishers. I mean, I was under the impression you were actually trying to kill it. Somehow it dies, though, which gives us our second body of the thing for the scientists to examine. Having an idea of its behavior before it was killed means that Blair can make some educated guesses as to what they're dealing with. A strange, unknown organism that mimics other life forms as a means to infiltrate, consume other creatures, and propagate its own survival. This, for instance. That's not dog. It's imitation. Nothing but tofu and soy. Trying to find answers means they look over the data that Dr. Copper recovered from the Norwegian base. It seems they found something a few miles from where they were stationed, and dug it up with the help of some motherfucking thermite. Since the tapes don't show what it is they actually found, Mac and friends head back out to find out exactly what it was they dug up. A 
very large and impressive matte painting. One difference between the original book and this movie is that the spaceship was in 10,000 year old ice, not 100,000. Also, Norwegians didn't find it. There was no other science team. It was all on these guys. Also in the book, the thermite explosion destroyed the flying saucer, whereas here, we just see it's in rough shape and they never even go in it to see how it looks, instead heading a little further away from the crash site for yet another shocking revelation. Cut out is a familiar shape. Hearing that the thing may in fact be from another world, the station erupts in rampant speculation. Happens all the time, man. They're falling out of the skies like flies. Government knows all about it, right, Mac? Uh, yeah, it's just like that time someone's family pet transformed into the blob and killed the entire neighborhood, and the government comes through and tells us all it was just a weather balloon. Suffice to say, they don't know a damn thing about what they're dealing with. Nels is more concerned with people throwing their shredded underwear into the kitchen trash bins, and the only one with any concept of biology here is Wilfred Brimley. So he does what 80s scientists tend to do. Tells his computer alien organism and shit, and the thing spits out some Atari 2600 graphics to explain the plot. The creature eats other creatures, and then imitates them to keep from being detected long enough to safely feed again. If something like this were to reach a populated area, the entire world could be destroyed in a mere three years. Don't you worry, Blair's got a 38 special, so that when the end of the world comes, he can have a 38 special. For the time being, it's decided they should store the rotting carcasses in the storage room. Not under ice or anything, which you would think would be pretty easy in Antarctica, but just somewhere they can easily rot, because that'll preserve them when it comes time to win all those science awards for the science done here. Problem is, Blair has locked himself away in his lab, and refuses to come out, and Fuchs has come with some research notes of Blair's that he has to tell Mac at once as long as it's in secret, completely away from anyone who may benefit from hearing this. There is still cellular activity in these burned remains. They're not dead yet. And you brought me out here, alone, and far away from the thing with all the people around it who may benefit very well from knowing this information. Why? That way, Bennett can be alone with the thing for just long enough to be given the La Blue Girl treatment. But when Windows runs off to ask Mac for help, Bennings has slipped away. A whole 40 feet, so they don't have any problem catching up to him, or proving to the rest of the guys he's not who he seems. I bet they just caught him in the middle of auditioning for Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mac BURNS HIM TO DEATH EITHER WAY! This time, they're quite a bit more thorough with the job, ensuring that every last piece of the thing is burnt to a crisp. That's all well and good, but they can't seem to find where Blair has run off to. Until Mac spots Blair running away from the helicopter, that is. Oh, it's cool. He was just giving the thing one of those Apple firmware updates. The sounds of gunfire get Mac to rush inside, where he finds Blair going absolutely apeshit, wrecking the radio room, windows wounded in the corner, and the science guy raving on and on about how fucked everything is. That thing wanted to be on! Shell gets out. Imitate everything on the face of the earth! And if you listen, it makes perfect sense why he'd wreck the helicopter and radio. Well... I mean, the helicopter, the radio, hasn't worked all movie. But it's to prevent the thing from reaching a populated area in the first place. Save the world. Kill your co-workers. Don't, don't actually do that. After Childs tries to calm the man, unsuccessfully, Mac rushes in and punches Wilford Brimley the fuck out. As he is now a danger to himself and others, it's decided he should be locked up alone in the shed. He's not so violent anymore after enough sedative, but he still has words of warning for Mac. Watch Clark. And watch him close, do you hear me? Okay, now the movie is downright telling us, THIS IS THE MAN YOU SHOULD BE SUSPICIOUS OF! SUSPECT HIM! With Blair secluded, and nobody watching him, Mac figures they have to do something to weed out who may or may not be... THINGS. Problem is, as Childs pointed out, if they are imitated perfectly, how the hell are you supposed to know? Don't worry, Dr. Copper figures a blood test, mixing their blood with uncontaminated blood, might be a way to find out. As if the blood comes from one of these things, there might be a reaction. 
Problem with this plan is someone already got to the blood, and thus this becomes a contest in who can point the finger away from themselves the fastest, starting with who even had a key to the blood cooler. I just give it to Copper whenever he needs it. Could anybody have gotten it from you, Doc? I don't see how. As soon as I'm finished, I return it right away. It's one half debate, one half staring contest. In the middle of all the commotion, Windows breaks down and runs off to get a shotgun. This gives Gary a chance to pull out his sidearm again and make everyone even more convinced that he's out of his mind and therefore one of the things. Mac, on the other hand, who is still in control of himself, de-escalates the situation by assuming control as the new leader of the group. After all, he's motherfucking Kurt Russell. With him in charge, they decide to keep a close eye on Gary, Dr. Copper, and Clark, sedating them so they'll be easier to control. Pukes, you start working on a new tab. I need Doc's help. Yeah, you don't want to drug me. Dr. Copper also seems to have failed all of those courses about how to not sound extremely suspicious when surrounded by paranoia and death. And then again, he's not the only one who has next to no idea what to do in this kind of situation. If a small particle of this thing is enough to take over an entire organism, then everyone should prepare their own meals. And I suggest we only eat out of cans. Yeah, I know that's technically how it works, but uh, what's the hard limit here? Can a cat-sized blob of the thing take over a human-sized prey? Or is a single cell really all you need to eventually do it? Because if it's the latter, then couldn't the thing just run around the base spitting on everyone and eventually win? No bother, they have to check on Blair. But Fuchs finds some suspicious-looking ripped clothes of Macready's. He's missing around the same time a fuse goes out in the lab, and nobody knows where he is. So not only is the group breaking down, not trusting each other, but when Mac reaches Blair's shed to question him, he's peculiarly chipper. I'm not gonna harm anybody, and there's nothing wrong with me. And if there was, I'm all better now. I'd like to come back inside. Now you got my promise. And can I take my friend Noose here and hang out? Whenever I'm feeling down, he's always there to lift me up. He also ensures that Fuchs isn't someone they should worry about, but they still won't let him come back inside. They have a search to conduct, and they do find Fuchs shortly afterward, burnt to a crisp. But it's him, all right. They figure he burnt himself to avoid being eaten by the thing. One odd thing, though, is Max's lights are on, and he knows he left them off. Back inside the base, though, they're wondering what's taking so long for the group to return. Eventually, Nalls makes it back, and has quite the story to tell. <laughs> He was stashed in his own oil furnace. Wind must have dislodged it, but I don't think he saw me finding it. I made sure I got ahead of him. So the one who's been leading the charge for destroying the thing is actually secretly the thing. And don't get me wrong, that would be a really good disguise, but you would think if he was the thing, he might be slightly less enthusiastic about this. Therefore, everyone tries to stop Mac from getting back to safety out of the freezing conditions. This means he has to break through a window and threaten everyone with dynamite in order to get them to stop trying to throw him out. This is still a really stressful situation, obviously, and Vince collapses. I'm not breathing! One time, Doc. Get him in here. And bring the others. Gather everyone together, because this is going to be one hell of a scene. Quite the memorable one, showcasing the work of Rob Botton and the dozens of other people who worked on the special effects makeup for this movie. But as you can tell from me geeking out before anything even happens, this medical emergency doesn't go exactly as the characters anticipated. Clear! Clear. Ah! It turns out Vance was the thing. Or a thing. There's quite a few of them running around to get away with calling it the. It's not just that shot that makes this a memorable scene for practical effects, but the monster that erupts out of the patient's chest and is subsequently blasted by a motherfucking flamethrower! But it ain't done yet. Breaking off its own head, the thing slithers away in an attempt to escape, growing a brand new set of legs and eyes to aid it. The thing almost manages to run off, and then is blasted by even more fiery goodness. Thus, it's toast. But this gives Mac an idea. First things first, he's got to tie some of them down and convince the others not to try to kill him while he's getting everyone ready. And when threatening everyone with dynamite doesn't work, just shoot a motherfucker in the face! Then they all calm down and listen to you. Which doesn't really seem to work for me. I mean, I think if I were there, I'd just piss myself and run. After that, he gets everyone to agree to his little game. Everyone but Windows and Mac are tied down, and everyone's blood is collected. Mac says since Vance Thing's head tried to flee to escape, the blood will do the same to try to escape a hot needle. 
After testing Windows and himself, he determines they are both still human and continues the tests. Now, Clark. And Clark was human, huh? Which makes you a murderer, don't it? Uh, no, Clark was charging at him with a scalpel in hand. I'm pretty sure self-defense is still a thing in Antarctica. No bother. Next up is Palmer. One might be wondering why the thing doesn't just tough it out to remain unnoticed, but it is imitating a petri dish full of blood, so it might be a little small for complex thought processes beyond just basic instinct. Having been found out, though, Palmer changes form into a horrifying split-headed monster. This wouldn't be much of an issue if Max Firewall wasn't completely devoid of any kinds of quality assurance, but at the end of the day, it's Windows who falls prey to the terrors before them. That means by the time Max Flamen Verfer can Ver Flamen again, not only does he have to take out Palmer, but Windows shortly after. Okie dokie, back to the blood tests then. Okay, that's it then. Everyone's passed and we can just let bygones be bygones. I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter TIED TO THIS FUCKING COUCH! And that clip is absolutely perfect to describe the situation for anyone suffering from a seasonal flu. I only wish that the channel were actually large enough that I could demand that become a meme and it actually work. There's still one person left who hasn't had their blood tested yet. Wilfred Brimley, surprisingly enough. When they go to the shed, though, not only is he nowhere to be found, but it seems he's dug a secret basement and is building an escape vehicle of his very own. Where was he trying to go? Any place but here. Oh well, no shit, people don't generally buy airline tickets to spend their weekend sitting at home on the couch eating bonbons. It gets worse. Blair Thing has cut the power to the point where they're all going to freeze to death very soon. It's playing the long game. Freeze itself now so that it may thaw out later when a rescue team arrives. Therefore, Mac decides to take a stand and kill the thing right here and now, with the help of the few survivors he has with him. Together, they burn each room in the base to a crisp, and then head below to set up charges and blow the whole thing sky high. Childs disappears on the surface mysteriously, though, and while they're setting charges... <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's like he's holding his face Bethesda style. As this is a horror movie, Niles doesn't mention seeing something weird and just quietly sneaks toward his likely death, with Mac none the wiser until our hero is left alone in the cold, dead silence. What the hell was that, Kurt? I don't think insurance fraud works against parasitic extraterrestrial changelings. But this is our final confrontation. And we've got a, a little less than a minute, so no fight. We have just enough time to show off the monstrosity that is the thing before Kurt Russell does him in with a catchy one-liner. Yeah, fuck you two! Or that. I guess the dynamite really was the deciding factor in that battle. Therefore, dark ending. The thing is dead, but Mac is going to be soon anyway. But what's this? Childs came back from just off screen. He seems human enough, but as we know, they always seem human. The end? Question mark? Well, the thing video game from the sixth generation follows this movie's events right where this leaves off, so no. But in any case, that was the thing. And believe it or not, Critics fucking hated it when it first came out. Not sure about audiences, though. It did do very badly at the box office, but it came out shortly after E.T. and on the same day as Blade Runner. E.T. was taking everyone's money, and Blade Runner did horribly in theaters, but eventually became known as one of the greatest films ever made. I think the thing likely scored low with critics because... It's horror, and that's something a lot of critics don't like. It sounds silly to put it like that, but if you've been watching my show for a while, you know what I mean. Horror is meant to instill a sense of dread and terror in the audience. 
not make you feel good as he was a hero save the day. The thing gives that feeling of dread, not by its very impressive gore and creature effects, but by how it's set up, where you really don't know who you can trust. Part of that is because they simply don't give the information to the viewer to even give you a chance to figure it out. It is something I complain about a lot in so-called mystery movies, but here it works because the point is you can't figure out who it is you can trust, and leaving that kind of information out in the open would hurt the movie's fear factor in the long run. Another effect the lack of information has is the fan novels written trying to theorize exactly who was a thing at what point. I find rampant speculation at that level a bit much, but you gotta admit it gives you plenty to talk about. Overall, the thing is about a mysterious, indescribable monster that stalks an isolated group in a desolate wasteland. It's not gonna make any critics out there giggle or feel inspired for the strength of the human spirit, but it's gonna make you feel uneasy and possibly queasy. Also, with effects this complex, it's more than a disservice to call it cheap shock horror, cause that's expensive as fuck. It also comes in at five unspeakably awful, indescribable horrors out of five. Which is, inc which is an incredibly safe rating to give this movie these days. It's amazing what a few decades will do for your film. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, Save the world. Kill your co-workers. Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Becker Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And it's time to dig into Tremors. This has been a request for quite a while, and this October I'd like to tackle the Tremors series of movies. It's the perfect time, October, home of Halloween, to feature a series of monster movies that fit perfectly. Or at least they did when they were still only four, and as I do my show every Wednesday, and there's four Wednesdays in October, it fit perfectly, and then they just had to release a fifth just now, so now it's gonna end up bleeding into October, and people are gonna think that I threw this together in the last minute just to fucking capitalize on the fact that they just came out with a new Tremors movie. Word it all is, this week we're going to be looking at a film that kicked the series off, Tremors, directed by Ron Underwood. Perhaps the classic monster movie of the 90s. While Tremors didn't perform very well in theaters, video sales and rentals were off the charts. The basic concept is your good old monster movie plot. A small town, isolated from the rest of the world, is besieged by creatures never before seen, and must fight for survival. That's, uh, pretty much it. So, let's take a look at Tremors and see if the basic monster movie formula holds up, or if the whole thing just ends up feeling a little shallow. Zing! The film opens up to introducing the two guys we'll be following throughout the story. Valentine, played by Kevin Bacon, and his older, wiser business partner, Earl, played by Fred Ward. They play off each other well as soon as we see them, making it relatively easy to take in the fact that they live their lives as low-pay labor in the small town of perfection. What's on the agenda for today? It's garbage day. Oh, man. I'm gonna get some jackass who thinks he's funny shooting at us again. It's obvious that neither of them care much for their life out in bumfuck nowhere, but before they can discuss it too much, Valentine makes a detour to give a friendly neighborhood welcome to the new grad student that just arrived, whom he hopes has a few specific features. Long blonde hair, big green eyes, world-class breasts, ass that won't quit, and legs that go all the way up. First things first, Bacon, find out if you can say hello without her calling the police with your exuberance that may be more difficult than it has to be. Damn it.
and it turns out the college student is not bestowed with such endowments that would allow them to be able to coast through life on looks alone, making getting a college education moot. Such a tragedy. Nevertheless, this is Rhonda Lebeck, played by Finn Carter. She's doing some legwork for the university scientists to earn some credits towards her seismology degree. Well, I've been getting some really strange readings. I mean, the school's had these machines up here for three years, and we've never recorded anything like this. So either we're going to experience an oil geyser Beverly Hillbilly style, or horrible subterranean monsters are going to show up and kill everybody. That's yeah, still a little fuzzy. And that's enough silly exposition for now, so the two of them leave their work driving into town where we meet up with several more faces for this picture. Melvin, played by a young Robert Jane, Walter Chang, played by the legendary Victor Wong, and our doomsday preppers Burton Heather Gummer, played by Michael Gross and Reba McIntyre, respectively. The way you worry, you're gonna have a heart attack before you get a chance to survive World War III. We'll see, we'll see. Joke's on him. The walls of my bomb shelter are made out of millions of crushed Benadryl tablets. Just chip off a little bit and I'll survive that heart attack too. The thing is, as the town has such a low population, there's not much time to spend introducing everyone, so we just watch them doing mundane labor. Normally in a horror movie, this would signify that somebody is about to die horribly, but not so today. We just get to see how much shit these two have to deal with before they finally quit. You know how close I am to leaving this place right now? I'll call that little bluff. How close? About 500 gallons or so. Indeed, while years of hard labor for meager wages was just inconvenient, having to take a midday shower was just going too far. So Val and Earl pack up, ready to leave for the prosperous land of Bixby. That is, if the side quest dialogues would stop interrupting them. We're not delivering firewood anymore. We're heading for Bixby permanent. Oh, sure. Oh my god, you really are! Well, in that case, you should take this crate to that mayor. And also, along the way, there's an aardvark infestation, so if you can kill a bunch of them, and prove you did by collecting ten or so aardvark tails, that'd be mighty funny. This would be Nancy Sterngood, played by Charlotte Stewart, and her daughter Mindy, played by an extremely young Ariana Richards. You know, Lex from Jurassic Park. The point is, while the guys want to leave, Nancy tempts them with a preview of the quest reward. I'll throw in lunches. And beer. Oh god, if she throws an Xbox Live, I don't know if I can take it. Joke's on her, it's 1990. The Xbox hasn't been invented yet. Now there is nothing, and I mean nothing between us and Bixby, but nothing. How long till they stop for something? <laughs> Even shorter if you count it from the time when they decided to stop. They halted their progress because the two of them just couldn't help picking up a good Samaritan side quest, helping out a local who, through some twist of fate, has found himself up on a high voltage tower. Of course, he won't come down when called, so Val has to go and wake the guy up. This may prove more difficult than anticipated. As Edgar is but a corpse! And a very well-preserved one, didn't even get his eyes pecked out by buzzards. Man, that PG-13 rating is something else. Died of dehydration. Thirst. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. I figured up there he could have got an unlimited supply of Joe Cola. Dr. Jim, played by Conrad Bachman, says that no matter how weird it sounds that Edgar would just climb up that thing and stay up there three or more days required to die of dehydration, that's his diagnosis and he's sticking to it. In case this has been far too hard to piece together, we jump over to old Fred, played by Michael Van Wagner, to figure out what exactly the problem is. Things in the ground killing people! Or, well, potentially killing people. And come to think of it, Fred was the first one to die. Edgar was just scared up there on the pole, like, for a few days until he died. They didn't actually kill him directly, so... That means they waited up there and then they grabbed Actually, this just makes it more confusing. Now that Val and Nero finished going back into town to drop off Edgar's body, they head back out, but again get sidetracked when they notice that Fred's sheep are slaughtered. And Fred himself. Ah, oh, Jesus! What the hell's going on? I mean, what the hell is going on? It's the monster movie. You gotta establish people, places, and horrible deaths. Thus, they run like hell, right back into town. Better get the hell out of here. There's a killer on the loose. What? A murderer, man, a real psycho. He's he's he's, he's cutting people's heads off. I'm not kidding. Well, oh, fair enough. But couldn't you, you know, escape towards Bixby and then call the police and you know do all that stuff and you know personal safety and just just asking. Of course, the road workers don't believe him, but we do get to watch these unimportant characters continue to engage in mundane tasks. Therefore... Wow. Just 
Wow, what the fuck do you think that is? Strawberry jam? In his dumbfounded stupor, he doesn't realize his ankle is caught up in a cable, leading to both his own untimely death and that of his partner. Never mind all that, though. Val and Earl have made it back to town just in time to find out the phone lines are down, and introduce two more characters. Nestor, played by Richard Marcus, and Tony Gennaro is Miguel. Point is, now they have to turn right back around and drive to Bixby to contact the police. Uh, there's a teeny little problem this time. Is there some higher force at work here? I was going to ask the same question in regards to how the hell you managed to not run out of gas in that thing. I would assume they could just drive around the road, but I can't see the area so much, so that might be too presumptuous. The point is, after they figure out that the road workers are auditioning for the role of a live-action meat wad, it's time to rush back to town as fast as they can go. Jesus, I don't believe this. Yeah, hung up. It's not the most badass way to start barrel-assing your way down the road. In any case, it beats the engine refusing to turn over for the umpteenth time. Eventually, they get the car to move and return to town, but news of the road being out is not nearly as interesting as what everyone else has noticed. Oh, Bart, be careful. Ugh, for real. And now, this small American town learns the true horror of Cialis. This phallic predator is dead, but no one knows what kind of creature it is. However, if it is responsible for the string of deaths, they come to a startling conclusion. Just one of these could need a friend in this flock sheep. So you think there are more of them out there? I fucking hope so, we're only 20 minutes in. With this in mind, everyone stumbles to figure out how to survive this terror, and make money off it at the same time, of course. But with the phones out, the road out, and no way to radio for help thanks to the surrounding mountains, oh, well, there's not too many options. We got the cliffs to the north, mountains to the east and the west. That's why I had them be settled here in the first place. Geographic isolation. Madden, this is the only county in the state that doesn't have some dogmatic law against a man's love of his bovines. While over 30 miles is far too long to walk, and the cars are out, because they figure someone could ride the Bigsby on Walter's horses. Who's best on a horse? Are y'all just saying that because I'm wearing a cowboy hat? Fucking prejudicial, I swear. It doesn't take much to convince these guys to saddle up and ride into the sunset to save the town. Also helps that they get food, water, and weapons for their quest. Along the way, they discover that the doctor and his wife were brutally killed in a scene that I felt wasn't important enough to show. But before they can make it to the next city, their horses start to freak out, buck up, and throw them to the ground. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, what about the horses? What's the it's like hentai if it were invented south of the border. What the hell are they? Sons of bitches. I am a professor and son of bitchology. They fight the creatures off, but soon find to be in over their heads. Must be a million of them! Nope, just one. Which finally reveals the monster for this movie, which actually underwent several changes in pre-production. You would think that Giant Killer Worm would be pretty straightforward, but when their initial design had a hard exoskeleton that would slide back to reveal a soft interior, well, they kind of changed that instead of going with the name for the movie Attack of the Sand Dingies. Unfortunately, without their horses and finding the rifles only pissed these things off, the guys run like hell. On the plus side, there's a concrete trench for them to escape into. He's dead. And despite being jai fucking enormous and able to burrow through dirt fast as fuck, a couple of inches of concrete is more than enough to just kill these fuckers, it seems. Now, of course, would be the best time for Rhonda to pop up and rejoin this movie. What's going on? Did you notice anything weird a minute ago? I mean, it just happened. I just like how she had to have been close enough to hear them screaming earlier, or at the very least heard the gunshots, and finding them in that ditch, she's just like, hey, how's the weather? With her help, they expose and examine the corpse of the beast, a fantastic creature unlike anything the world has ever seen. Except, you know, giant fucking worms. But never mind. This is truly a momentous occasion in science. There's just one little problem. The way I figure it, there's three more of these things. What? No, this is the first movie. You only do one of the first movie and save that multiplier shtick for the sequels. 
not like they have much time to question this theory, as before long they get a very clear hint to its validity. Looks like the one that grabbed our truck! Damn it, why'd you have to point out a defining feature of the thing? Now it's going to survive all the way to the climax and you know it. Of course, our protagonists may not be so lucky thanks to their current predicament. While the creature cannot kill them as they have perched atop a large boulder, they can't get off said boulder without the creature killing them. Doesn't he have a home to go to? No, I'm still confused. They gorge on entire flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, and then person after person, one after the other. And then they just kind of camp out for a few days, just waiting. Are they hungry or aren't they? Luckily for them, Rhonda figures out that there's a convenient stack of wooden poles right next to the boulders. And even more lucky for them, large boulders spaced just far enough apart for them to be able to pole vault between them on the way to their truck, which also happens to be right next to a boulder. Thus, they are able to escape and head back into town, where we can get down to the important part. Grilling Rhonda for failing as her job as cliche scientist in this monster movie. Look, these creatures are absolutely unprecedented. Yeah, but where do they come from? Yeah. For the entire movie, where they come from and what they're called actually goes unsaid. And personally, I like that about Tremors. I mean, when you get down to it, once they grab you and drag you underground and start chewing on your ass, such frivolous details really don't matter. Of course, that doesn't mean that these characters don't let that bother them. For suckoids, points. Point. I like snakeoids. Or they hold on to you from the hem of your jeans. Hemorrhoids. Rhonda is able to explain that these subterranean hunters track their prey by feeling vibrations. Hey, so like we don't vibrate, right? Just have to stand still, you know? Hold your breath and stop pumping blood, and then they can't kill you. In frustration at all this speculative bullshit, Valentine points out that they have to prepare, because the worms are coming, and if they just stand around bickering, the monsters will come up from the ground and grab them too! Well, that's what I like. Graboid! That's it, Graboid! Or maybe, if they use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate... Polaroids! It still stands they need to prepare for the worst, as they don't know exactly how long they have until the creatures reach town. Not very long at all! Turns out the critters just couldn't resist grabbing Melvin's ball. Wait. Unfortunately, the kid survives this attack, while everyone else manages to run to escape the creature. Well, almost everyone. Get off the so, three monsters left, and there's people all over town, completely unprepared, just waiting to be eaten. What exactly do they get? Wire, but don't worry, the monsters are nothing if not a fan of suspense, working on killing her as slowly as possible. Now your friend. Look, I know you probably won't get another shot at this, but now's not the time. But it does free her from the wire of death, and allows them to evade the suddenly lethargic predators. After they collect themselves, it's time to come up with a new plan to escape the valley, which they can't quite figure out before this happens. Turn it off! I mean, yeah, they were walking in boots on a hardwood floor this whole time, but you know, unless the Foley guy kicks in, it doesn't actually make sound. So that plan takes a backseat to the current crisis, surviving within the next five minutes. With that in mind, everyone rushes up to the rooftops. On the plus side, Bert and Heather finally return from their off-screen adventure, and while it's harder than it has to be, they establish radio communications with the guys in the main drag. Well, good, the Doomsday Preppers are in relative safety and can strategize with them about how to kill the worms. You know, so long as nobody just makes a ridiculous amount of noise for no apparent reason. Brass Tumbler! And that'll do it. Quick question though, what the fuck were you shooting at today that you wound up with so much spent brass in need of cleaning? Even better, they're in the basement, meaning this is the loudest fucking dinner bell these monsters have ever heard. That, combined with the fact that it takes them far too long to understand giant subterranean worms coming to kill you, this gets very dangerous very fast. Jesus Christ! 
How many times I gotta tell him it's Jesus Christ, we're all gonna die over. But they aren't going to die, partly due to the giant fucking wall of guns and the fact that they actually know how to use the damn things. Yeah. I can see why he married her. Once Bert gets his hand on that 500 Nitro Express elephant gun and realizes that, like Skaggs, you score a critical hit if you shoot him while their mouth is open. Brand. We're taking chips to the flavor frontier, where the vinegar zings and the... Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Nega Shadow. The internet personality without much summer left. Or sanity, it seems. But, uh, yeah, welcome to week. to movie. whatever. of. The summer of Freddy versus Jason! Jason goes to hell. The Final Friday. Yes, this is another so-called final movie that is about as final as Final Fantasy. But there's some more dreadful things to note here. After Jason Takes Manhattan did so poorly, taking in 15 million on a budget of 5 million, Paramount decided that it was time to dump the franchise to the highest bidder. That turned out to be New Line Cinema, aka the house that Freddy built. Meaning while the crossover film was now more likely than ever, Jason Voorhees was in the hands of a company with no history with the franchise. It's not all bad, though, as they figured the first thing they should do is release a new entry in the series with some of the most respected faces ever to grace Friday the 13th, Kane Hodder and Sean S. Cunningham. You remember Sean, right? Writer and director of the original Friday the 13th. Gonna be like bringing Wes Craven back in New Nightmare, right? Well, no. Evidently, Sean never bothered watching any of the Friday the 13th movies past the second, gave the director's seat and writer's chair to Adam Marcus, who never wrote or directed anything before this movie, and still seemed to hold disdain towards the franchise for focusing on Jason as a killer, a concept he found almost as stupid as that damn hockey mask. <laughs> well, then. Let's take a motherfucking look at Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday and see what the fuck they did with it. <clears throat> I suppose it starts out promising enough on a dark and spooky night near Crystal Lake. We see a lone woman, Elizabeth Marcus, played by Julie Michaels, enter a run-down cabin in desperate need of repair. She works to fix the place up for the night, but there's still an air of tension and the feeling that there's someone nearby watching her. But if it is Jason, it seems he's gotten bored with the whole drag you out and dismember you style of horror and moved on to just fucking with people. She doesn't let this bother her though, she's going for a nice relaxing night alone on Crystal Lake, which calls for some naked time and a warm bath. Like <laughs> her toe touched the water, she was naked, that counts as skinny dipping, it's on, bitch! She quickly covers up in a towel to investigate the source of the blackout and orchestral cue, which to nobody's surprise... <laughs> His Jason voice. It was just here. 
And supposedly there was a tie-in comic that did explain how the hell Jason got here after being left in a New York sewer post-toxic waste baptism, but in the movie, it just goes completely unexplained. And hell, at least in the previous entries in the franchise, they at least took the time to remind everyone where the hell Jason came from. As Jason has a big fucking machete and Elizabeth has a fluffy towel, she runs for her life. After a short sprint through the woods, she suddenly stops and waits for Jason to catch up. Hey, do you want to earn money when you shop? Then sign up for Jewel. Jewel is a luxury retail cashback site that allows you to earn real money when you shop like normal. Go to usejewel.com to shop hundreds of your favorite luxury beauty and wellness brands. Sign up today and start earning. Get started at usejewel.com. The RPG mobile hit of 2019 now cross-platform on PC. Same great gameplay, all new animations and textures. Turn-based battle collection for serious RPG fans. A massive online community. Play better, play faster, play everywhere. Raid Shadow Legends, now on desktop. Play ball, batting for the Jersey Devils, it's the man with a killer swing, Jason Voorhees. Open fire! Wow. Sports become a hell of a lot more competitive than I remember. Despite the heavily armed men shooting the machete almost as often as Jason himself, they nevertheless manage to riddle him with bullets until someone decides to just blow the fucker up. Well, that was Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday. My thoughts? I don't think so. Damn it, Creighton, I I've seen this movie once, isn't that enough? As it turns out, this was a government agency working to take down the threat of Jason Voorhees, along with Agent Elizabeth Marcus. Nothing left to do but clean up the body parts, including the ominous heart, and give the booming opening credit sequence spliced into the autopsy scene, introducing Richard Gant as the coroner. Starring the fuck out of John D. LeMay! Anyone listening must have C4 clearance or higher. If not, you're in a heap of trouble. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a minute. Did, did they speed up the ch 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 sound effect or is the cameraman jerking off? <laughs> Okay, we get it. Credits or autopsy sequence. Pick one and stick with it, movie. The subject is a victim of multiple bullet wounds. It's gonna be a real joy to count. Looks like that's our target. Oh, geez, it's taking so long even the autopsy scene is getting boring. Moving on to the important part of the examination, the heart is quite puzzling. It's twice the size of a normal human heart, filled with weird not blood and still beating. But most importantly of all... It's downright tasty! This has the adverse effect of turning the coroner into Jason. Or, at the very least, Jason is now possessing the poor guy. It's too bad he spoiled his appetite with Voorhees heart already, because his assistant, played by Dean Loray, has just arrived with takeout. Yes, that's a probe. I had a feeling this was going to end badly as soon as I heard the word probe. 
Despite being covered in blood from the mouth down, even the security guards, played by Tony Iverolina and Kane Hodder, don't think anything of this, so they just get fucking killed, as we suddenly switch over to a news broadcast, American Case File, starring Robert Campbell, played by Stephen Culp. It seems in between movies, Jason went from being a spooky summer camp ghost story to a household name nationwide serial killer, and even his more supernatural aspects are well known, as explained by Creighton Duke, played by Stephen Williams. What you think of as Jason is not Jason. That body he's wearing, that's just me. And he knows this the fuck how. Eh, yeah. oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there were eight movies of events before this, and Jason was just on Arsenio also. I, I guess it does make sense when you think about it. Duke here knows that Jason can't die from explosions, but only a very specific convoluted ritual, which he is keeping secret to the tune of half a million dollars. Thus, we move away from the dark flavor inching far too close to the found footage genre for my tastes, over to a diner where Diana Kimball, played by Aaron Gray, gives our first hints of what the secret method is by running right into Creighton Duke. I'm gonna kill Jason Voorhees. I need you to help me. Jason Voorhees is dead. No, 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 Freddy's dead. Jason goes to hell. I mean, they were both made under New Line Cinema, so I get how it can be confusing, but you'll figure it out eventually. Seeing as this guy showed up out of nowhere with no backstory and started demanding things of the rest of the characters, Sheriff Landis, played by Billy Green Bush, tries to intervene. Why don't you blow me, Chief? Hmm? Right after your girlfriend there gets through. <laughs> oh. And thus begins a manly contest of manliness. Which, somehow I feel like the Sheriff is going to draw the short straw on. Or not, as he just resorts to having one of his underlings drag the bounty hunter off, saving his masculinity for another day. This encounter did get Diana a bit concerned, however, so she confines with Stephen, played by John D. LeMay, that there's something he absolutely must know about her and her daughter. Later! Come to my house tonight at, at 11, and don't be late. Something of dire importance with utmost need for punctuality where you cannot afford to be distracted for a second? Insert random camper scene! Steven decides, fuck listening to Diana, let's pick up three hitchhikers, Deborah, Luke, and Alexis, played by Michelle Clooney, Michael B. Silver, and Catherine Atwood, respectively. They're on their way to Camp Crystal Lake now that Jason is surely dead, so they can go skinny dipping and have teen sex without having to worry about hulking monster men tearing their friends into pieces. Despite the invitation to get laid, Steve turns it down to get back to the plot where he belongs. We, however, stick around the abandoned campsite to watch the teens enjoying nature. It's about the fastest pee I think I've ever seen. And not, not that I <laughs> make a habit of watching women pee. <laughs> I, I uh, look, look, Jason. <laughs> okay, now we can get back to being scared and shocked at slasher villains killing people and forget <laughs> that anyone ever brought up peeing. Okay, that can't be accidental. J Jason, you want to get me out of this one? Uh. Ah! Ah! Thanks, buddy. Moving on. Steve didn't waste time, though. Don't worry, Dinah hasn't even left the diner yet. She's just closing up. Ah! Gosh! Me! Gosh! I, I was just going to the car. I didn't need to scare you. I frequently sneak behind women in the middle of the night and put my hands on them. That's... that's okay, isn't it? I mean, I haven't been doing it wrong this whole time, have I? This is Josh, played by Andrew Block. He's just here to reassure Diana that her relationship things are gonna be alright before his relationship thing, Edna, played by Diana Georgia, shows up and Jason teleports his ass all the way there from the camp to kill her, kidnap him, and... uh... Turn this movie into a really weird fetish film. Oddly, I don't think I can blame Creepy for this one. With uh, that's done, uh, Diana receives a call from her daughter, Jessica, played by Carrie Keegan. Seems Jessica has a new boyfriend, Robert, from the TV. Unfortunately, their conversation is soon cut short. <laughs> Mom? <laughs> what are you doing? 
Okay, before I thought Jason in the Mirror was just a cinematic touch, but if others can actually see that, I... Wait, well, actually, uh... You know, there's the whole supernatural aspect where the mirror is a reflection of the soul, which is why vampires don't show up in mirrors, so... In that angle, I guess it would make sense that Jason shows up as Jason no matter whose body he's in, but, uh... You trying to explain supernatural reflection scientifically? <laughs> Creepy would not approve. You say that like I care about the approval of a man who spends his time having conversations with plush dolls. Pot. Meet Kettle! Fortunately, Diana doesn't take this lying down and shoots Jason in the fucking head. Now, of course, this is Jason we're talking about, and even when he's got the body on loan, it's hard for him to go down. Have no fear, Steven is here, and ready to fight the possessed policeman and save the day. <laughs> Using the woman you're trying to save as a human shield, though, not the best strategy. Taking a page from Jason's playbook, Steve impales him with a fireplace poker, and the man ends up going out of a window. Unfortunately for Steven, though, not only is Diana dying too fast to tell him much outside of Save Jessica, but after she dies, Ed shows up, Josh is long gone, and Steve is standing there covered in blood, swearing it wasn't him, but the zombie that did this. Thus, it's off to the pokey with him, where his policeman friend, Randy Parker, played by Kip Marcus, locks him up. You're about the saddest looking sack of shit I've ever seen. And who would just so happen to be in the cell directly adjacent to him but Creighton Duke. As the walking exposition dump for this movie, Duke pulls out of his ass the last few events as well. Hell, if he knows how to kill Jason with no explanation, obviously he knows what's been going on in town while he's been locked up just because. He could help Steven, but as we established, information has a cost. And the cost of this is very, very high. Are you ready to pay? You accept PayPal? Oh, fuck! Well, take that as a no. Duke's anally sourced information essentially consists of Jessica being the only one who can kill Jason, but also being one of the only ones whom he could fully resurrect into completely. It turns out Diana was Jason's sister, so he's got a body hop until either getting back into the body of one of the Voorhees' bloodline, or his heart is destroyed by a Voorhees. Now that he knows, Steven uses the old injured prisoner routine, uh, never mind that he's actually injured, to escape so that he can rescue Jessica. Later, first he's got to stop by the back room of the diner in the horribly designed daycare center Jessica's highly overpaid babysitter built for Jessica's baby, the daughter Steven didn't even know he had. I don't even know your name. Steven. Yeah, it's not my first choice for a daughter. I know that's what you want, more power to you, but... I mean, you ever think of maybe... Taylor? Alex? This is Ward, played by Adam Craner. Despite hearing 